Welcome back! In my previous videos, I frequently talked about near fields and far fields. But what does it practically mean in terms of printed circuit boards? In this video, we're going to talk about this and we're going to talk about the concept of wave impedance, near field antenna propagation, far field antenna propagation, and the frequently encountered types of antennas on PCBs. Later on, we will also go back to the lab and have a look at the frequently used tools to measure near-field antenna radiation as well as far-field antenna radiation. So first of all, let's review some basic concepts of electromagnetic wave propagation. As you would remember, as electromagnetic wave propagates, the electric and magnetic fields create one another, where time-changing magnetic fields produces time-changing electric field, and time-changing electric field produces time-changing magnetic field. This happens with electric and magnetic fields being orthogonal to one another and propagating at 90 degrees. The main components of electromagnetic wave are the frequency and the amplitude. The wavelength of electromagnetic wave is related to its frequency. The second most important thing to remember is that time-changing signals always create electromagnetic waves such as digital clocks or pulsating DC-DC converters any of the above. However, direct current does not create electromagnetic waves because it's fixed at its voltage and does not change in time. Electric current as we receive it on a printed circuit board is a combination of electromagnetic radiation, which is action at distance, with the physical flow of charged particles. And the physical flow of charged particles is typically governed by Ohm's law, but any of this electromagnetic radiation stuff is not, and this is where Ohm's law really falls apart. So on a printed circuit board, conductors, which are your traces, are guiding the waves from point A to point B, but don't necessarily carry any charged particles. Radio waves are in fact following the same physical laws as visible light, for example, and other things such as gamma rays or x-rays and all this fancy stuff. Whereas EMC is in fact a regulated measurement of emissions caused in a far field by radiating elements as well as through conductors, for example through mains, which also implies the disturbances in the form of harmonic, flicker or transients. EMC also includes electrostatic discharge, which is a natural phenomena that can cause devices to blow up and uh, is very harmful to electronic devices. For the rest of this video, let's concentrate on radiated emissions. And as the radiated emissions begin to originate from electronic circuit, they start to propagate through empty or not so empty space and this is what we're going to look at. So let's examine what actually happens to electromagnetic waves as they propagate in space from an electronic device. Let's imagine we've got here a printed circuit board with a patch antenna. And the antenna is going to have a varying current which is going to create electromagnetic waves. As the electromagnetic waves begin to propagate away from the antenna, the distribution is not uniform. The immediate region in front of the antenna we call reactive near field. Reactive near field is defined by this formula here, which is 0.62 times square root of d cube over wavelength. d is the maximum linear dimension of the antenna, which means it can be either a length or a diameter. In other words, if it's a patch antenna, we can draw a diameter line across it and this is most likely going to be our largest dimension. We can also define the near field region in relation to pi and uh, that would be about 0.159 of the wavelength. In the reactive near field, the electromagnetic wave is going to be dominated either by E field or by H field. If we're dealing with high intensity fast speed switching current, 
this is going to be H field that dominates the reactive near field. And the reason for that is related to the concept of wave impedance. So what wave impedance really is, is a resistance of air or medium to electromagnetic propagation. As you would know, impedance in general is a resistance that varies with time. So the wave impedance is the same thing but in air. And in air it equals to approximately 377 ohm. So getting back to H fields and E fields, E fields are going to have high wave impedance at the low distance from the source and H fields are going to have low wave impedance at the close distance from the source. So E fields will dominate in linear power supplies while H fields will dominate in switching high intensity power supplies as an example. So moving on from reactive near field at lambda over 2 pi distance the electromagnetic wave begins to radiate and this is the region that we call radiating near field and it's also called sometimes as Fresnel region. This region is characterized with distance larger than wavelength over 2 pi but smaller than 2 times d squared over wavelength. And this distance, 2 times d squared over wavelength, is also called Fraunhofer distance. The Fraunhofer distance defines transition into the far field. So as you can see, all those distances relate to the frequency of the emitting source and to the dimensions of the antenna. But what is the difference between radiating near field and far field? Well, as you know, in a far field, such as for example in vacuum when we receive a light from a galaxy far, far away, electric and magnetic field components are equal. Also, the time-changing electric field will produce the time-changing magnetic field and the time-changing magnetic field will produce time-changing electric field which is exactly what allows electromagnetic wave to propagate in free space. However, in the reactive near field, as I've said earlier, this is completely dominated by either E field or an H field. So that means that there's got to be a region where this transition occurs from a very reactive one to the far field condition. And in the radiating near field region, we're going to have some very complex waveforms so that the electromagnetic wave will be perhaps 60% electric field and 40% magnetic field or 80 to 20 or any kind of ratio in between which makes it very difficult to predict how exactly the electromagnetic wave is going to look like in the radiating near field. And because of that, it also becomes really difficult to predict how it's going to attenuate in the radiating near field either. Whereas in the far field, we know exactly how the electromagnetic wave is going to attenuate because of the path loss formula, which is related to freeze propagation formula. And the attenuation is going to be 4 pi times distance times frequency over speed of light and everything squared. So the main point I'm getting at is that in radiating near field the composition of electromagnetic waveform and its attenuation factor are going to be highly unpredictable. And this is why when we go to an EMC test house we always test in a far field and none of the standards specify the electromagnetic performance in the near field whether it's radiating or reacting, it doesn't matter. We always test in a far field. Also in a far field, sometimes we will have electric fields on a maximum and uh, magnetic fields on a minimum because, as you remember, EM wave is orthogonal, so it's going to have its high and low points. Meaning that we really want to capture the data in both vertical and horizontal orientation of the antenna if the antenna is polarization sensitive. 
A polarization insensitive antenna such as a circle antenna does not have such issue and can significantly reduce the testing time. The test distance is always fixed by the applicable EMC standards such as EN55032 and it is related to the wavelength of the highest clock frequency on the printed circuit board. Let's also briefly talk about the types of antenna we may frequently encounter on a printed circuit board. Well, first of all, we have to distinguish between intentional antennas and unintentional antennas. Whereas intentional antenna would be a patch antenna as shown here, where we actually want to transmit and receive radio frequencies. This would be used, let's say, for Bluetooth communication, Wi-Fi, LTE or such. Then we also get unintentional antennas and uh, that is simply something that you don't want. It's a kind of electromagnetic radiation that is going to fail your EMC test. From the structural point of view, antennas are typically classified either as dipole or loop antennas. Whereas a dipole will have two elements that would be located close to each other and the energy will be passing in between and this is similar to a capacitor and uh, if we think about it a capacitor is really anything and it could be your PCB trace 1 and PCB trace 2 so anything can act as a capacitor if it has conductor 1 and conductor 2 close to each other and they propagate throughout some distance and uh, this is where the capacitive coupling comes from so this is called capacitive coupling the other example is a loop such as this which would be an inductive coupling so this is inductor and um, a coil loop of wire is going to create magnetic fields radiating away from it so both capacitive and inductive coupling on a printed circuit board can create antennas that will uh, fail your EMC test. And the goal of the engineer designing a printed circuit board is to maximize the intentional radiation from antennas and to minimize the unintentional radiation of the antennas. We will also have spurious emissions coming off an antenna that is designed let's say to work in 2.4 gigahertz but due to harmonics in a spectrum it's going to have some sort of uh, spur that may be at 2.6 gigahertz and that can also fail our EMC so how do you deal with those scenarios well first of all you have to design a good antenna that does not have spurs and secondly you really want to look into your printed circuit board to make sure you really don't have um, any kind of traces that would act like antennas such as long wires or traces running in parallel for really long periods of time. The other thing that you may want to do is you want to create a shield around your unintentional radiators and this is something I covered in another video. But to summarize here, you want to apply your shield in radiating near field and the reason for that is because in reacting near field the magnetic field will most likely dominate if it's a high intensity current source however because of physics the H field is not likely to reflect easily and it's going to be absorbed by the shield and um, if the thickness of the shield is not really large if it's only 0.1 millimeter or something like that then the amount of attenuation is going to be quite low so if you are shielding a high intensity current source you want to give it some distance to let the H field close the loop and then you apply a shield in radiating near field so that the resulting E fields that are created by the H field are reflected back into the circuit. Another important strategy to use when applying electromagnetic shielding is to use what's called nested approach meaning that first you're going to apply a localized shield around your radiating element and then you're going to have to apply another shield around the entire PCB and then if necessary you're going to apply another shield around the entire product and with each added shield you're going to have more and more attenuation level 
This typically works much more effective than having one very thick shield. It is also a lot cheaper. But in order to be good, the shield must not have any gaps, so it must be made as tight as possible and uh, not have any kind of uh, impedance disturbances across the shield, which may happen, for example, if your shield is made of multiple parts and they don't have very good connection between them. Now let's go back to the lab and have a look at the tools that we use to measure near-field and far-field electromagnetic radiation. So now let's have a look at the tools that we use for near-field measurements. Ta-da! Those are electric near-field probes and magnetic near-field probes, which is literally just a loop antenna. This set of probes has been designed to work in a range between 9 kHz to 5 GHz, which means that the capacitive coupling from the tip to the circuit can withstand a very large bandwidth. And this is how those toys are designed. So electric field probes really look just like pencils. And in my previous video that I made on the topic of EMC debugging, I did not really talk too much about electric field probes and the reason for it is because high intensity fast switching currents such as clock sources or DC-DC converters are completely dominated by magnetic fields and magnetic loops that go around them and terminate back on their sources. And speed is really the key here because the faster is the rate of change the stronger is going to be the electromagnetic field that originates from this source. So what E-field probes are really good for? Well, they are actually used to measure emissions coming from low intensity and uh, low speed uh, circuits. But those kind of circuits are rarely the source of the problem. So most of the time we do indeed use H-field loops like this one here and when we apply an H-field loop we must try both orientations because as you should remember electromagnetic wave propagation changes as it radiates away from the source. With the E-field probe this isn't the case because it is polarization insensitive meaning that it's kind of circular and no matter at what orientation or at what polarization the wave is going to hit it, it's not going to have any difference in readings. In my setup I have also got a biconical antenna which I use for far field testing. As you can see the dimension of this antenna are quite large. What it really is, is just a dipole. And the resonance in the antenna is achieved by coupling between the poles of the antenna. So the electromagnetic field originates or received in this space here. So this is where the energy actually propagates. And those poles are simply receiving the EM fields. Using this antenna indoors is quite challenging because it perceives radiation from literally everywhere. So the best way to use it is actually outside and you can go to a parking lot and set it up there with a spectrum analyzer on a sunny day and this is probably the best way to test electronic circuits in a far field without going into any coic chamber.